The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to our number four of tonight's show. My name is Rob McConnell, coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. You can always send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com, on MSN Messenger, as well as, let me see, Facebook, uh, and all the other social media networks, Exxon Radio TV. And, of course, we're coming to you around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and you're watching us on Simul TV Channel 54, which is the Exxon TV channel. And to find out how you can subscribe to the Exxon as well as to Simul TV, visit www.simultv.com. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Gloria Prema, and we've had the pleasure of having this young lady on the show before. And Gloria, welcome to the Exxon. How are you doing tonight? Good morning, Rob. Thank you for having me again. Oh, great talking to you. You're in the United Kingdom, right? Yes. Whereabouts? Uh, in Scotland, Perthshire in Scotland, right in the right. middle. Wow, it's pretty early over there, isn't it? What's it about? It's, uh, uh, 6, 6 a.m. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. thank you for getting up so early. <laughs> so how have you been since you and I last talked? Yeah, I've been well, thank you. Um, just working away on the book. I've, since we last spoke, I've given the book a new subtitle. It's uh, Otherwise, the book's exactly the same, but it has a new subtitle, Juicy Science mm-hmm. Meets Spirituality Without Religion. I love it. I love it. For our viewers and listeners who haven't had the pleasure of hearing or seeing... ...the physics to describe it, um, what was happening, because it was so real, it was so obvious, not just for me, but for other people. So... Um, so that set me off on the spiritual path. And then, um, as I explained in the book, 17 years later, I, I was able to put science and spiritual, or what we call spiritual phenomena mm-hmm. together. And I investigated many different fields of spiritual phenomena during that time. As I discuss in the book, things like near-death experiences, telepathy, things like that. So um, so it's all in the book. So I've, I've managed to include a lot of things in there, which I hope... Um, you know, can appeal to people and help them to understand their spiritual nature better. Is it it fair to say that science and spirituality are basically on the same track? Not yet. They've been far apart for a very long time, not speaking to each other. Um, Mm -hmm. Tendency for science to dismiss spiritual phenomena. But... um, there's more and more evidence coming out now that that points to this other reality and quantum physics. I mean, it was quantum physics really back in the day that helped me to put together a lot of my theory because, you know, as you know, quantum physics talks about at least 11 other dimensions. Right. And so I'm able to explain these dimensions with my theory as being simply faster speeds of light, harmonic speeds of light. And I, I describe what I mean by harmonic um, because, you know, um, they used to say that, that, well, you can't go faster than light, but yes, you can. And in yeah. fact, experiments have already proven that. So what is the main evidence for saying it's all light? Well, uh, one of the things I I um, discussed very early in the theory is that, you know, in quantum physics, they say that every particle, they've discovered that every particle is just spinning energy or constant energy, and they don't know what that energy is, and they don't know where it comes from. And um, they just call it energy. But, you know, what energy? Well, I'm saying it's light, and the argument for that is because light is the only energy that's in constant motion or perpetual motion and so this is why I'm saying it's all light because it is constant it is perpetual it's just there all the time so that's the main reason why I'm saying it's light right 
So if everything is made out of light via sound, as you say, how does it create actual physical matter? Um, well, this is done through the really the central theme of the book, which is the morphic resonance fields. Mm -hmm. um, I discuss these at length and I give evidence, photographic evidence. Um, there's a whole field of study called cymatics. And this oh, it was, goes right back to the late 1700s, um, uh, where they discovered that if you, you can create patterns and shapes using sound, the frequencies of sound, on a plate, you know, scatter sand or something, attach a frequency generator to the plate. And as you change the frequency of the sound, the pattern changes immediately, you know, beautiful geometric patterns. Right. Yeah. That was the beginnings. And it was furthered in the 1950s by uh, Dr. Hans Yeni. And he was able to create three dimensional forms and shapes from not just sand or powder, but from liquids and other materials. So, um, so those were the principles of um, sound creating form or shape. And I'm saying that that principle is, is uh, creating matter out of light waves. Um, the light waves that we've been constantly traveling, constantly spinning along and they're vortexial, they're, they're spiraling. When they encounter a morphic template field, which is in existence, the fields are all part of the overall sound of the universe, the harmony, which in the book I call Om, right. because it's an ancient sound found throughout many cultures. So when the light wave travels along and encounters a morphic resonance field, it takes its place in the pattern that's existent in that field. And it does this by spinning in on itself, because when it can't, it constantly moves, it can't do anything that constantly move. When it encounters a field, it can't go forward, but it spins in on itself thereby creating the little subatomic particle. And that's how, yeah, that's how matter is made out of light. Is there any other evidence for the uh, morphic resonance fields? Um, there are, there is. Um, in the 1950s, um, an e electrical engineer by the name of Harold Saxton Burr was um, experimenting with seeds and seedlings, eggs, things like that. And he discovered a type of electrical field around the seed or around the egg and the field was the same shape as the adult plant or the adult animal hmm. and the seed or the seedling grew into the shape that was in the of the field existent field so that's um uh the field was a morphic resonance template and then in the 1960s um uh, um, Alfred Vogel, his name, he was uh, working with IBM at the time with uh, liquid crystals. And he also found a type of electrical field around the liquid crystal, which the crystal, the liquid eventually solidified into the shape of this existent field. So those are some examples throughout history. Fascinating stuff. And uh, you and I have to take a break, young lady. Please stand by and explanation. Uh, what is your website so our listeners can go and visit uh, after the show here? Yeah, it's it's alllight.co.uk. It's alllight.co.uk. .co.uk. Mm -hmm. Gloria, we'll be back after this very short break. Don't go away. And Exxon Nation, if you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, exxon Radio TV, And of course... If you'd like information on how to subscribe to um, Simul TV so you can watch us on the Exxon TV channel and the other great programming we have there for you, 724-365, go to www.simultv.com. I'm Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. Gloria Prem is my guest. Her website is itsalllight.co.uk. Um, Gloria, are there more and more members of the scientific community who are taking a look at science and bringing spirituality into it like you are yes it's happening a lot now there's a lot of um, different scientists who are looking at the more spiritual side of thing and i would say physicists in particular mm -hmm. um, because of perhaps because of quantum physics you were mentioning before that it's all like can be applied to parts of spirituality and even the paranormal for and and i i believe you said near-death experiences am i correct there 
Yes, yes. How, how would that apply? Can you give us examples? Yes. I give a, a, a good example in the book, but, um, you know, there's so much out there now on the internet that people are beginning to record them for everyone to see. Um, and they're so common around the world. They've been happening for a long time that um, people used to be dismissed, you know, when they talked about them. But, <clears throat> but now there's books, there's mm. people on YouTube all over the place talking about their experience. And um, a famous one is Dr. Eben Alexander. I don't know if you've come across him. He was a, a neurosurgeon who, you know, used to dismiss such notions as near-death experiences. And then he had his own. It's a very well-documented case. And he shouldn't have survived, but he did. And he had this wonderful experience where he went to this other realm. And um, and he, he didn't actually have a, an actual physical death, but he was so close to death. For, and he was in a coma for seven days. And, you know, his condition meant he shouldn't have survived. But there's so many cases where the person did actually die and the, and this was recorded by medical staff and sometimes in some cases the, it was for 10 20 minutes even mm -hmm. so the person shouldn't have survived afterwards but they did and the the common thing is they all talk about how they go to this place that seems to be filled with light first of all they're drawn through a, a tunnel now, I, I can even explain this with the vortex theory in my, in my, my theory, because the spiraling light wave is just a fundamental principle throughout all of the theory. And even the tunnel that people see and drawn into at the end of life is a vortex spiral. They're drawn into it. And I believe that this is the gateway to the next dimension, to the other dimensions. Each is connected by vortex gateway, a vortex tunnel of light. So it's the same principle, principle that follows throughout all the dimensions. Physics would call it a wormhole. You know, you've heard of the wormholes. Sure, yeah. about? Well, it's the same thing. It's a, a vortex tunnel of light that connects the different dimensions. So <clears throat> with the near-death experience, is it the soul? Is it the energy? Is it the essence of the person that is transposed from this dimension to the next? leaving the if you'll excuse the expression the the meat body behind yes it's the consciousness that survives now i give the argument that uh, the consciousness must survive death of the body because consciousness you know what gives the ability and first of all in physics energy is described as the ability to do work mm -hmm. so what gives the body the ability to do work well, it's the consciousness, because without the consciousness, the body can't do anything. So my argument is when the body dies, when the physical body dies, the consciousness must survive death of the body, because energy, the first law of thermodynamics says energy can't be created or destroyed. So that means that when the body dies, the consciousness, which is the energy, must survive. And so, you know, the body decays into the el different elements, but the consciousness survives because it's energy and it travels and all the evidence tells us it travels, leaves the body and travels through the vortex gateway into another dimension. And the people who have these experiences, I say millions throughout history, throughout uh, the whole world, commonly report the same thing that they leave the body, they find themselves drawn through this tunnel most of the time. They then experience themselves in a different place. It's a different, um, it's, they say it seems to be made of light, that like, there's a, a light element to all of it. Uh, they have very, very similar experiences in every case. So if this if consciousness can go into the vortex, into the next um, universe or dimension. Can it come back? Yes, because the people who have died have come back and and lived to talk about it. But what would happen? What would happen if their body, if they if they died, <laughs> they were pronounced dead. Their body is put into the ground. And from the other side, they say, hmm, geez, I think I'm going to go back to this dimension. What happens then? Yes. Is no, that, that what be... we call a ghost? 
Ah, I see what you mean. Yes, it would be too late for the body, obviously, if yeah. it has reached that stage. But um, yes, I mean, the phenomena of, uh, in the book, I talk about the phenomena of spirits and ghosts and visions that people have, which again, are so common mm -hmm. throughout time, throughout history. And that's when the, because, because in this other dimension, we have what they call a light body. So we can, we still have, we still look like ourselves. And people meet deceased relatives on the other side as well, and they, they recognize them instantly. Very often they say they look younger, they look healthier and younger mm. um, because of the nature of where they are. Um, but yes, we, so we have this body, we can still retain, because you see the morphic resonance field has many different levels to it, even our physical body. This is just one level, but we have, you know, the in the esoteric or the, the ageless wisdom teachings, I'm a, a long time student of that. They talk about the different stages or different layers that we have to us. We have the physical body, we have a mental body, we have a, uh, an etheric body and mm -hmm. on and on, different layers to us. And each is vibrating at a different frequency of light. Um, so when you leave, when you discard the physical body, that body's gone, but the, the soul in essence, uh, which is really our true selves, still exists in the other dimensions where you can still have a body. Now, as you ascend to the higher and higher and higher dimensions, there's no need for a body, it's just pure consciousness. Um, but as I explain in the book, it's when you appear to someone in a different dimension, so say when someone sees a spirit in this dimension, mm -hmm. Um, or has a vision of some sort, that, what has happened there, it's like, well, I use the analogy of like tuning a radio or a television. So you turn a dial, in this dimension, you see the picture, you hear the sound, you turn the dial to a different frequency, you pick up a whole different picture and a whole different sound, which was still right there in the room. All the different frequencies, all the different sounds are right here but you only pick up the one that you're tuned to. So this is how I explain how a spirit on the other side could adjust a frequency to appear in this dimension, or someone in this dimension can have a, an experience where their frequency has temporarily retuned and they pick up another station or another reality. And that's when they tend to see something or hear something. Um, it's very common and it can happen, it can happen with, um, well, you can achieve it through meditation, for example, certain types of meditation may give you that experience, but it can also happen if, um, if you have some kind of um, shock or, or trauma that can temporarily right. change your frequency. And people often report this, you know, when they've had an accident or they're in an accident, a car accident, they'll sometimes find themselves outside of their body and they can see their body or they may experience um, a, a vast slowing down of time. You know, this is very common where they feel that time stops and they see right. it in slow motion mm -hmm. um, or they very often see um, what they sometimes call an angel who comes and helps them or saves them in some way. Um, or see a deceased loved one. So that these are all quite common experiences. All right. Let me let me pose a hypothetical question here. Let's say that I die. I decide I'm I'm going to go through the through the wormhole to the next dimension. My body, you know, just disintegrates ashes to ashes and then I want to become reincarnated how does that work out because I'm in a dimension where reincarnation shouldn't have the ability or is that is it in that other dimension where reincarnation actually takes place yes that's right Rob I research reincarnation at length 
as part of this theory. Mm -hmm. And there's, again, there's a whole body of evidence to support the, the, the subject of reincarnation. Um, one famous, uh, well, quite famous um, study is the work of Dr. Ian Stevenson, a uh, Canadian um, doctor, and he, he spent years investigating the claims of um, reincarnation from children. Yeah. And, you know, it's quite common for children to talk about their previous life up until about the age of six or seven, they tend to then forget. But very young children um, sometimes talk about their previous life, their previous mummy and daddy, that type of thing. So he was very curious about this and he did, he, you know, studied the subject at, in depth. And he left a whole body of work behind um, I think it was something like 3,000 cases he studied in depth and he was able to show that the child who, you know, they claimed to be this person with a, a life in a certain place, mm -hmm. etc. He was able to follow up and investigate and he, he found that in most cases um, the person that the child described did exist and did live in that place, did have that family with those names that he mentioned, they mentioned and um, very often, the, um, well, perhaps not very often, but sometimes a child will have a birthmark and the birthmark corresponds to a wound, the fatal wound in the previous life on the same part of the body. So that can happen as well. Would but it be it's safe to... been, been uh, investigated quite thoroughly. Hmm. Would it be safe to say that your theory is further supported by uh, an example that I can use as being the uh, fiber optics because it's light that's used in fiber optics. And if we're saying that spirits are the result of light, am I right? Yes. Or, okay, is, would that support the theory? Fiber the fiber op optic theory, yeah. Um, what do you mean by the fiber optic theory, Rob? Well, uh, all right. For example, here in our studios, we use fiber optics. We don't use the old um, copper coaxial anymore. Everything is fiber optic. It's mm -hmm. fast. It's clean. It's light that's emanated. Uh, mm -hmm. So would, yeah. this, would this kind of be a useful example for somebody who is trying to understand how we go from this... Uh, this dimension to the next through the wormhole as, as, as light consciousness? Yes, light. Yes, thank you. Light is a technology that's, you know, becoming more and more applied in our mm -hmm. everyday world and fiber optics is one of them. There's also, there's also um, various technologies now using light, healing technologies. And, you know, as I say in the book, light and sound will be the medicine of the future. Yeah. But it's already here because uh, the beginnings of it, um, because you have various things on the market now. I've, he I've heard uh, recently about the light wave patches. It's a patch that you can wear on your body and it emanates a particular frequency of light. Yeah. It'll pr produce a healing effect, but there's lots of, um, and a light wand, you know, that, Shine, shine a particular frequency on the body. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's many technologies now coming out of this. But yes, light is uh, is the medicine of the future. I know for a fact that about ten years ago, NASA, or more than that, it must be about twenty five years ago, mm -hmm. NASA was using and and experimenting with different colored LED lights and different frequencies, and in healing modalities for the astronauts. Mm. Yeah. yeah. There's you and I have to background, yes. Yeah. You and I have to take a break. Please stand by and Exxon Nation, our guest is Gloria Prema. And if you'd like to find out more about Gloria, visit her website. It's all light dot uk. We'll be back after this break as we continue right here in the Exxon. So whatever you do, don't go away because if you go away, you're going to miss a lot. Gloria Prema and I are back here, Exxon Nation. How are you doing over there, Gloria? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, what was it that made you go into the into the area of expertise that you're in right now? 
Well, it was, as I say, it was, I was studying my science degree all those years mm -hmm. ago. I had just, I was, I had just completed the first year when I had this spiritual healing experience. And then I, I, I practiced it and learned how to do it. And it was so natural. It felt so natural, you know, like I'd done it before that type of feeling. Um, and I was seeing results like real mm -hmm. physical, tangible results which to me is first class evidence. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I decided to pursue that, look into it and discover, you know, as I say, the physics of how that can happen. And it was light that I was working with actually, because in spiritual healing, you're, you're accessing light. You call in light. There's a technique you go through to call in the light. Uh, the purity of the light uh, to be a good channel for the light to go where it's needed. But isn't uh, but isn't but isn't this just a the light is non visual? Isn't this just a um, a, a ritualistic light that you know mm -hmm. you don't see the light. Uh -huh. Some people like yourself can actually feel the energy that's there, but they don't see the light. Mm -hmm. Have we lost connection, Rob? I, I think we're back. There we go. Uh, Are you yeah. there? I'm there. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Um, yes, I see what you mean. The I'm not physically seeing the light, mm -hmm. but I see it with my inner vision, my the third eye. It's sometimes called. Um, you get you have to get yourself into a certain place of calm and it's a bit like prayer i suppose you know when you pray right you're, you're connecting with what you consider to be a source of love and help so that's how you begin a healing session so um so i've been a call in the light and as soon as i do that i visualize the light traveling down through my heart out through my hands and at that moment I then feel a pulse and that's, that's physical. Mm -hmm. I feel the physical pulse and then I direct it, you know, to the person who has asked for the help. You don't do it without someone asking. Um, then I, with my inner vision, I see it traveling throughout the body. Now, you, someone could say, well, that, you know, you're just imagining it, but, at the beginning, I wondered if I was imagining what I was seeing. But, you know, over 30 years, I've, tr I've tested and tested and tested. Yeah. And it was only when, and I used to sometimes wonder if I was seeing things, but I was seeing the physical results. That was my evidence. Well, um, what kind of physical results were you seeing? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first, first lady who came, she had fallen down a hole in the garden outside and twisted her ankle Ooh. and she went to the doctor and she, she was told she would she was limping she was in a lot of pain she was told she would need six months of physiotherapy and she had one healing session i directed the light to her ankle and i noticed that i i, I saw the light in my mm -hmm. inner vision as colors lots of different colors going in and then it finished with just white light now the white light contains all the colors but when it finishes with the white light, I know I know that the session is done. Um, anyway, so the upshot was um, the next morning, she had a lot of pain in the ankle during the night. Interesting, but there's a reason for that. Because as we discovered, everything was going back into place. But the next morning she woke up, her foot was back to normal. I mean, normal, as if it had never happened. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and so I asked her, did you go to the doctor? Did you tell the doctor? But, yeah, and she did, but the doctor dismissed, <laughs> he dismissed her case. He didn't have an answer. But um, so that was, to me, that was a very, very obvious evidence that something was happening. Um, uh, lot, so lots of things like that. Unexplainable, Rob. That was why I had to pursue it to find the answer, because in physical terms, mm -hmm. it's unexplainable. You know, a lot of people within the paranormal community say that 
science needs to get involved in into the investigation of the paranormal in order to make it normal because it's only paranormal because we don't understand the science behind it. Um, I, I would imagine that you're one of the very few scientists in the world that are actually taking a good look at this. How does that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, I think there, I think there probably are a lot of people who are looking into this, but perhaps we don't hear about them. Well, not in the media, the media, doesn't cover things like this but there probably are a lot of people looking into it i know that there are a lot of healers around a lot of people who are doing mm -hmm. different types of he healing uh, different methods of healing but in essence uh, they're pulling in energy from other dimensions to do it and it sometimes has different names i mean i trained with um, the National Federation of Spiritual Healers in the UK, which is a very long established organization going back to 1954, started by Harry Edwards. Um, so it's a very long organization in the UK, but there, over the years, people have called it different names like quantum healing and, mm -hmm. you know, Reiki is a type of healing, kind of similar, perhaps not exactly the same, but there's lots of different methods of healing. You, you said they pull in the energy from the, another dimension. So the energy is able to be accessible through the worm, uh, through the um, wormhole or the spiral. Yeah. Yes. With our consciousness, Rob, we can access the other dimensions. As I said, you know, through meditation, through attuning, right. you can have your own practice of how you achieve that attuning, but that's what you're doing. You're tuning to a different um, frequency of light and, perhaps a different speed of light, you know, in one of the other harmonic dimensions. And with practice and with inner training and focus, you can achieve other um, connection with higher and higher dimensions of light. And, and can I just say, Rob, the reason why, the physics reason why the healing happens mm -hmm. is because, as I explain in the book, as you, as you go to the higher and higher or really faster and faster speeds of light, there's more healing, there's more purity because of coherence. And I talk about coherence in the book, you know, coherent light waves are light waves, you know, if, if you imagine them 2D light waves on a graph, um, they can be all jumping all over the place and chaotic. But when you get into a state of inner calmness and connecting with a source of love, whatever right. that may be for you, those light waves become coherent. And that's been demonstrated. And I talk about some of these demonstrations in the book. And can you get, the light can you... waves become coherent, they nest, they embed. And that coherence is very, very powerful. And you can access a purer um, healing effect from coherence. And I give many examples in the book. Can you coherence. give us one example? Mm. Well, the physicist Dan Winter, I came across him years ago, and he did a real-time experiment where he hooked his heart up to an electrocardiograph. And mm -hmm. he, he um, got himself into a, a state of love and compassion. Um, when he first hooked up to this electrocardiograph, the waves, you know, it was detecting his heart waves on a 2D graph, and they were chaotic. And he, as he ascent, descended into this um, feeling of love and compassion through med quiet meditation, and this was shown in real time, as he got into that state of love and compassion, the waves beca gradually became coherent. They nested into each other and they became coherent. Um, Professor William Tiller uh, he was a physicist uh, at Stanford University. He passed away a few months ago, but I quote his work in the book, and he gives a good example of the power of coherence. He said, if a typical light bulb, you switch on the light, light bulb and the photons all come out chaotically, so you never see, not coherently, in other words, so you never see the full potential of the light bulb. But he said, if those photons were to come out coherently, he said that the power of that light bulb will be, would be 
a thousand to a million times that of the sun. Wow. So that's the power of coherence, coherence, coherent light. All so right, stand by. We, we've got to take our, our final break. So uh, I, I'm just trying to imagine something much that much brighter than the sun. We'll be back on the other side as we wrap up. I'm sorry, dear. It's hard to imagine. It, it is. It is. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. Right, Exo Nation, we've got to take our final break. When we come back, more of this interesting topic with our guest this hour, Gloria Prema. And if you'd like to find out more about Gloria, maybe you'd like to get a hold of her book. It's very simple. The website is it's itsalllight.co.uk. Ta-da! We're back. Gloria Prem is our guest. And uh, first of all, Gloria, thanks so much for getting up so early in Scotland to join us tonight. It's always a great pleasure talking to you. And this is the first time I've been able to see you. So nice seeing you. That's right. <laughs> Thank um, you. Because of the research that you've done, your scientific credentials, the fact that you yourself have first-hand evidence on, ha on, on healing, have you presented your work to the medical community? And if so, what have, what have they said? They can't dispute the facts. You're a member of the scientific community. I haven't actually presented it to the medical community. Um, I actually don't really um, promote the healing work. Oh, so I see. Much. Yeah, these days. I do it if someone asks, but um, and I wrote about it, but I, I'm not trying to convince anyone, Rob. Um, I think it's something that speaks for itself. And uh, I'm interested in how I, what I do is promote, promote this theory, mm -hmm. the overall theory in the book, because I think it's important, especially now that with everything that's happening in the world, it's important to, um, for people to know about our spiritual nature. Because yeah, I, there's a lot of healing that comes from that. I think spirituality is gaining grounds uh, at a speed that a lot of people are not aware of. I, I further see the established religious philosophies falling by the way. Because, in my opinion, they talk the talk, but when it comes to spirituality, they don't walk the walk. And I think mm -hmm. that people are seeing this and they're... And they're taking it in themselves or they want to learn about it because they know there's more to this existence than what we're led to believe. Um, how is your theory being taken by the members of the scientific community? Yeah. Um, just touching on that point, you said, Rob, um, you know, I talk in the book about how our spiritual development hasn't kept pace with our technological development. Right. And it's leading to a very dangerous situation in the world. And that's why I'm interested in promoting the, the, the theory, the overall theory, which unites science and spirituality and brings them together. Mm -hmm. Because we need this for our, for our development, for our understanding, for healing. The world's in need of great healing. Um, so but, I've, I've given talks where I've been asked to give talks, mm -hmm. but... Um, I've not challenged the scientific community or anything like that. It's not my approach. I, I, t I speak where I'm asked to speak and present my evidence. And I feel the evidence is so strong. And the proof in many, many cases is so strong that it speaks for itself. But if, you know, I'm not doubting your evidence. I'm not doubting your theory. Mm -hmm. To me, it sounds wonderful. It's what the world needs, you know. So why not get out on the biggest orange crate you can find and, and tell the world about it? You know, and, and why not? Why wouldn't you want other members of the scientific community to have the ability to use it? Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure how to approach them, actually, or where to approach them. Um, mm. uh, as I say, I, I give talks when I, where I'm asked to speak. Right. But um, I haven't actually gone out and, you know, approach the the scientific community i did i was lucky enough to meet uh, dr brian o'leary <clears throat> back in the 90s in scotland actually he did some talks here in scotland in fintorn mm -hmm. and 
<clears throat> I was very fortunate to meet him because he was a wonderful scientist and he he was a NASA astronaut, trained astronaut. Yep. And he um, <clears throat> had a kind of awakening experience himself, which led him on a tour of the world to investigate the, <clears throat> the free energy devices that he was hearing about. I talk about this in the book as well, the zero point energy, which, which is pulling energy from another dimension, if you like. Um, and th in modern day physics, conventional physics, they shouldn't be able to operate because they would say, well, what energy? What's the zero point energy? It doesn't exist. It's impossible, right? But it's not. It's really, it's really a, a, a reality. And he proved that. He traveled the world and meeting these inventors who built these machines that operate on what we call zero point energy. They need some conventional energy to get them started. And then they just continuously produce energy apparently from nowhere but they're pulling it from the, the faster dimensions. So he's one person I was, I was um, in touch with and he actually thought that my theory was very young in those days. I had the basic ideas, but I hadn't fully formed the theory, but he, I was able to um, present it to him and he, he felt I was onto something at the time. Um, I also heard from someone um, who's who informed me that um, she had she came across my book and she contacted me and I asked her where she heard of the book and she heard it from a healer friend of hers and he heard about it from Doc, uh, Professor William Tiller, who I mentioned earlier. Translator. So he had read my work as well. So I have had some, um, you know, support in that way, but um, I've not been out in the world stage to to present it to science, just um, wherever I'm asked to speak. The time has come, my dear friend, where you and I must say so long. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. And here you are, God. What is it now going on? Seven o'clock or eight o'clock yes. in the morning? Mm -hmm. Continued success. Thank you. I, ho I, hope that, I hope that you get that theory book of yours into the hand that can blow it sky wide and that you get the proper accreditation and the proper laurels that you so rightfully deserve. Until then, let our listeners know how they can find out more about you and where they can get your book. Yes, uh, from the website, it's all light.co.uk. And the book and all my books actually are on Amazon at the moment and can be ordered from bookshops as well. Gloria, take care of yourself, and I look forward to the next time you and I meet back here in the X Zone. Until then, be well, my friend. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so Good much. night now, or good Bye. morning. Yes, goodbye. Bye-bye now. X Zone Nation, that's it for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And... Somebody questioned that saying the other day, and I just emailed them back saying, well, just think about it, where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. It says it all. To my senior producer here in the studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Craig, thank you very much. International Program Director, Mac Alexander, thank you. And to my senior executive producer, my wife, my best friend, Laura Rogers, always great working with you. So. Put the kettle on, get the coffee ready. I'm coming home. Good night, everyone.